All right, so what happens when we hit this Make Boolean Mesh button, which also lives here in uh, Boolean of your subtool menu, or, uh, Make Boolean Mesh, is we're going to make a new piece of geometry, and it's going to be a new tool until we append it back in. So anything that we have visible is going to be calculated and included in that new tool. So you want to make sure that you've got just the, the things that you want to be combined into the Boolean visible. And the next thing we need to do is apply our subdivisions. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit the Apply button. And that Apply button lives down here in Dynamic Subdivision and Apply. You've got to have Dynamic Subdivision enabled in order to have the Apply be an option for you. So obviously that's not going to be an issue now that we've, we've applied it. Okay, I'm not sure if it matters which one you've got selected, but I like to grab the top one. And we'll hit Make Boolean Mesh. So it'll go ahead and calculate what that new geo is going to look like. And as promised, it'll make a new tool. So we're going to just append it in, or rather insert, that geo. And I'm going to put it above everything else. So you can see it's got this U-Mesh prefix, which means it's this Boolean. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the visibility for the input stuff. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to hit Control-Z and Control-Z, which effectively undoes the addition of the subdivisions and just keeps this geometry super light and keeps the uh, overall ZBrush file efficient. And were I doing this for real, I would probably make a new group and call the group something like Processed Booleans or something. So once you've got it here, it looks nice, but the boundary here is really crunchy and will actually bake poorly. So if I zoom in on it a bit, you can see it's all full of these triangles, and those triangles are notorious for, for showing up as artifacts. So what we're going to want to do is we need to clean this up. So you can, you can dynamesh it if you want, uh, and to figure out what the resolution is, you basically just crank it up until you get something that preserves the detail well enough for something that you can live with. Uh, you can make it a little bit uh, more efficient if you get rid of this interior space. I didn't bother to do that because this is a demo and it's not a big deal. But if, you know, if you, you can imagine if you have like 20 or 30 or more of these in a, in a single f uh, scene, you want to keep your, your geometry, your poly count as low as possible and, and having empty volumes like that is, a, is not a great way to do that. But I'm not going to dynamesh it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a Ziri mesh it because I have never loved these super sharp boundaries. I'd rather have a little bit of a transitional form just like we do with everything else, a little bevel. So uh, the settings I need to use here for, for uh, Ziri mesh is I need to tell it to keep the groups because I want to be able to act on these once this process is complete. I want to tell it to uh, do zero group smoothing uh, in this process. I want to keep it as close to the original as possible. And for my adaptive size, normally, oh, sorry, the adaptive size we can totally leave here at 50. What I meant to do is target polygons. I'm going to increase this to 50. 50 is a high number, relatively speaking. It's not arbitrary. I did some testing, and 50 is the one that gave me the result that I like. But um, I don't need both of these around. Um, I'm only going to be working on the one. I can get it looking good and then just mirror it over. Uh, that 50 would be distributed across both of them. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete hidden here. And we can uh, enable zero measure. All right, so here we can see the result. And it looks like it's got a little bit of a hiccup here, which is potentially not going to work for me. So I may need to change the values. This one's got a little bit of a problem as well. So let me let me think about this for one second. All right, so I, I set it to, to 30, uh, 30,000 tries. And in my testing, I kind of noticed this too, where it's like the first time through, it'll give you one result. You change the value to some other number, you'll get a different result. And then if you change it back, you get a, a third result. So. It seems like there's something going on that's a little randomized for each pass, but this is generally what I'm looking for. There's like some kind of little strange thing potentially over there, depending on what the uh, viewing angle is. It looks okay now. But anyway, this is just to demonstrate uh, an idea. So what I want to do is I'm going to isolate my little interior pieces here. I'm going to go ahead and insert a little row, which I will then uh, hide again using select lasso. Set everything on the outside to one poly group, including this first row, and then everything on the inside to another poly group. And I'm actually going to do a, a crease poly group there. And I wanted this little guy to be creased as well. So we can. Um, I think there might be a thing here where I can crease open edges. Cool. 
All right, so now I'm just going to do a little inflate on the interior. Make sure I've got the sets polygroup all. And if I zoom out a bit, let's set our subdivision settings correctly. This guy got creased for some reason, so we'll just uncrease that. Great. All right, so that's a, a fairly simple way to both keep your high poly, poly counts kind of reasonable and to add a little bit of a, a transition between the, the line Boolean boundaries, which can otherwise be uh, a little bit on the sharp side. So that probably takes care of everything that I, I wanted to talk about for what my process looks like as a hard surface artist. We'll go ahead and uh, mirror this over. There are lots and lots of other approaches and lots of tools. And I think one of the things that's been a, a key takeaway for me over the years is people's final product tends to reflect the workflow, right? So if I'm working in something, like if I'm building some geometry with Fusion 360, which is a, a completely different approach to modeling, then my high poly geo looks very different. Um, I've seen people do work with Blender and it, it has a certain look and I've se seen people um, follow uh, a different workflow with, with, with the ZBrush, a, a really great example of a, of a fantastic uh, ZBrush artist that probably you've heard of uh, is Michael Pavlovich. And he's got a very different aesthetic style and uses a very different workflow. There's all kinds of different options. It's a really powerful tool and just one of many. So uh, hopefully this has been useful in your uh, journey towards becoming a, maybe a little more well-rounded of a hard surface artist at the very least. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out. My email address is isaac.oster at gmail.com. Thank you.